Take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Genesis 31. Genesis 31. We are in this moment for us now. And God is pleased to grow us and to glorify himself by taking us through many kinds of hardships. Some of those hardships are times like we are experiencing now with COVID-19. And some of you are really struggling with fear and anger and rebellion. What should have been a measured, mature response to change and transition have exposed your hearts Hearts that are driven by self, and driven by comfort, and ease, and fear. And the words of your heart are spilling over into Facebook, and Instagram, and all the social medias. Instead of gratitude to God, you are grumbling against God. Your heart idols are going on the journey with you into this new country that we are entering. And some of those hardships are through difficult and strained relationships. Our situation is amplifying small troubles in marital relationships. Couples are finding out they do struggle being in each other's space every moment of every day, of every second, of every microsecond. What should have been a good thing, lots of time together has become a hard thing, lots of time together. And some of these hardships are through transitions that lead from what you don't like in the present to what we fear will be true in the future. You face uncertainties about what life will be like in the coming months and years. What will change? And too many of you wrongly think we're going to go back to just like it was. Brothers and sisters, a crisis of this magnitude will produce lasting change. How will you handle it? Will you be ready to submit to God's providence? Will you want what God almost certainly is in the process of bringing? Some of God's holiness-making tools are called relatives. In their moment, thinking about them then in this text in Genesis, we will see here in this chapter of Genesis just that. Much of this will ring if we get the culture with a certain amount of, oh, been there, done that. And there are two major difficulties in this text. There is the trouble with transition. This family in this text is going through a dramatic change in their lives. They are leaving one place that they have known for a long time, have grown up in, and are moving into a new place and time that will most certainly be different. It will be a hugely changed sameness. And there's trouble in the family. They are sinning against one another now in open and dramatic waves. But these are the harvest of long sown seeds of deceit, and manipulation, and self centeredness. So let's get some background. Jacob has married two of the daughters of Laban. He has acquired great wealth and power, both in spite of the machinations of Laban and at his expense. Jacob had respectfully asked to leave and to go to his own homeland, having served out the required years for his wife. He has increased his wealth while keeping and breeding Laban's flock. And now the sons of Laban are jealous. They are beginning um, to make trouble. And Jacob has assembled his family out in the fields and among the flocks. And there he has rehearsed the recent providences of God and his larger promises. His family seems to be responding in faith and submission. It's time to go home. That's where we are left in verse 16. Do what you want to do and we will go. 
Now the trouble in this text is with in-laws. We usually think of in-law trouble as being with mothers-in-law. There are lots of websites with mother-in-law jokes and so on. I couldn't find any father-in-law ones. Yet the here, in this text, the in-law trouble is with the father-in-law. Well, it begins with a secret departure. Verses 17 to 21. Now having his family's agreement, Jacob begins the enormous job of preparing to move. This is not going to be two men in a truck. Verse 17, so Jacob rose and sent, set his sons and his wives on camels. He drove away all his livestock, all his property that he had gained, the livestock in his possession that he had acquired in Padan Aram, to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household gods. How do you steal one's gods? And Jacob tricked Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he intended to flee. He fled with all that he had and arose and crossed the Euphrates and set his face towards the hill country of Gilead. Well, we get a secret departure with his complete household. Jacob gathers up all of them, his children, his wives, his servants, his possessions. Now, this is no small enterprise. Jacob's is a huge tribe, vast herds, and a long, lumbering caravan. And he does so with aggravating circumstances, verse 19. And two things make the situation worse. First, he left when Laban was away. It was clear that Jacob waited to do all this till Laban would not be at home. He does not want the face-to-face -face confrontation and the conflict that it would almost certainly ensue. Laban is not going to take this kindly. And the second aggravating circumstance is, well, Rachel stole the gods. This is an act of an unbeliever. This is someone at least trusting in a charm while preparing to depart from home to the unknown. Or it may be, well, just full-blown idolatry. She wants her household gods to accompany her. You can almost get the feeling of, just in case Jacob's isn't. Both of these provide Laban with fuel for his anger, and he launches pursuit. Now, verse 20 to 21, Jacob also left with misdirecting actions. The word tricked here also occurs in verses 26 and 27. It means to misdirect or to steal the heart. And Moses is using the word intentionally here, and in Labor's later accusation to remind us that Jacob is still the trickster. It is God's accurate interpretation of Jacob's attitude and action. And it results in an immediate pursuit. Verses 22-24. Laban learns three days later that Jacob and his family are all gone. Remember, he's out shearing the sheep. Where are the sheep? They're with the sons. How far away the sons? Three days. So three days later, he finds out. When it was told Laban, verse 22, it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob had fled, he took his kinsmen with him and pursued him for seven days and followed close after him into the hill country of Gilead. God came to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream by night and said to him, you be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now notice this immediate pursuit is with a dangerous in intent. He gathers up his kinsmen and takes out in hot pursuit of Jacob. Now, Jacob has a three-day head start, so it takes seven days for him to catch up. Remember, they have to cross the Euphrates in the process. 
Moses records this in a way that sets the stage for what follows. The galloping pursuers are described as kinsmen, not as an army, but yet they probably were. They are described as pursuing and closing in with Jacob. So this may not be an army, but it is most certainly military language. But that pursuit is interrupted with a divine warning. Laban's dangerous intent becomes clearer as God warns him. Possibly on the night they camped within hailing distance, God comes to Laban in a dream and speaks to him, and God warns Laban not so much as to speak badly to Jacob with the intent, you must not harm him. Well, what follows then is an outraged confrontation, verses 25 through 42. You talk about in-law trouble. I doubt seriously that any of you have had your father-in-law gather the clan and hunt you down over a seven-day trek. Here are two powerful and prosperous tribal chieftains facing each other down. Here is a cunning and deeply deceived father-in-law preparing to hum attempt to humiliate his son-in-law. How? Well, with manipulative attacks, verses 25 to 30... Listen to what Moses writes. And Laban overtook Jacob. And Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country. And Laban with his kinsmen pitched tents to, and in the hill country of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? That you have tricked me and driven away my daughters like captives of the sword. Why did you flee secretly and trick me and did not tell me? so that I might have sent you away with mirth and songs, with tambourine and lyre. If you believe that, I've got a bridge for sale. Why do you not permit me to kiss my sons and daughters farewell? Now you have done foolishly. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying... Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. And now you have gone away because you longed greatly for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? Now Laban begins to attack Jacob verbally, trying to manipulate the situation. He tries to play the wounded and offended parent. Why would Jacob steal his daughter and his grandchildren away? Why sneak off? Why rob Laban of the opportunity to have a farewell party and send them off with appropriate affections and attentions? What kind of low family denying in-law disrespecting person are you? If it hadn't been for God's warning, I would punish you. I would hurt you. Now listen to the sarcastic attack on Jacob's character. You say you long for your family. This is how you treat family. And what you really did was steal my gods. Now Laban is putting Jacob on the defensive. He's excusing him of things he does not know are true. What in any of Laban's experience with Jacob would make him think that Jacob would steal his stupid idols? Moses' writing here is interesting. God is quietly at work. Don't you think that the manipulative accusation still touches a little bit of a sore spot in Jacob? Jacob well knows that this is the way he treats family, even his own. He was quite willing to deceive his father and to steal from his brother and then flee in order to keep what was not his. What kind of gods are they that allow themselves to be captured, stolen, and snuck away. All through this account, there is irony, if not sarcasm, dripped on these idols, these so-called gods. 
But Jacob responds with righteous indignation, verses 31 through 32. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I thought that you would take your daughters away from me by force. Anyone with whom you find your God shall not live in the presence of our kinsmen. You point out what I have that is yours. And take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Now if you write in your Bible, just write, Oops! Right there. Jacob is not going to be cowed by this sort of harsh and intimidating attack. He simply states what he knows, and Laban well knows since he is here seven days later with a kinsman army. He knows that Laban would not have allowed Jacob to leave, not peaceably. Verses 43 to 44 tell us why this is true. Laban has not and does not, and his descendants will not honor the intent or the words of an agreement. Jacob was fairly certain that he was not going to be sent off to his homeland with rejoicing and fond farewells. So with good reason, he has not acted foolishly, but possibly wisely. Jacob is so sure that no one in his camp would steal the idols that he says they will execute the thief. This is huge. If Laban can find anything that is his in Jacob's camp, then he can take it. And of course, what he doesn't know, that Rachel, who is his own heart idol, is herself a god thief. So now the scene turns to a fruitless searching. Verses 33 through 35. Again, this is great TV. Here a long and tedious search is launched. Verse 33. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two female servants. They did not find them. He went out of Leah's, Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle and sat on them. Laban felt all about the tent but did not find them. And she said to my father, let, it, let not my lord be angry that I cannot get up or rise before you for the way of women is upon me. So he searched but did not find the household gods. The order in which the tents are searched is illuminating of Laban's mind. He searches Jacob's. He searches Leah's. He searches their servants' tents. He finally goes to Rachel's tent. Well, here we have the thief. She has taken them and hid them in her camel saddle. These saddles are probably more like chairs than what we think of as a western saddle. They were designed to go between the humps or they were designed to sit on a single hump dromedary. They often had elaborate claws draped on them and pockets to hold and carry things in them. And it was quite common when they took them off of the camel, they carried them into the tent and they were chairs for when you were sitting in the tent. Now, she has learned her father's craft and manipulation well. She's sitting on the camel saddle where the gods are hidden. And she basically says, please excuse my not moving for you. I, I'm in my time of month. Now, it would take a stronger man than Laban to challenge a married daughter who is having, pardon me, her period. So he never found the purloined idols. Now, Jacob responds, understandably, with angry accusations. Verses 36 to 42. And Jacob became angry and berated Laban. Jacob said to Laban, what is my offense? What is my sin that you have so hotly pursued me? For you have felt through all my goods. What have you found of all your household goods? 
See it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen, that they may decide between us two. These 20 years I have been with you. Your ewes and ewes and your family goats have not miscarried, and I have not eaten the rams of your flocks. What was torn of wild beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. From my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. And there I was, by day, the night heat consumed me, by cold, by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These twenty years I have been in your house. I have served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock. And you have changed my wages ten times. If the God of my father and the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. So here's Laban, patently a conniving con man, accusing Jacob of a theft he did not commit and implying more, that he has taken daughters and children wrongly. His wounded indignation, Jacob's wounded indignation here is palatable. Where is the offense? Where is the sin? What have you found that was yours? Bring forth the proof of your accusations. You think my wives are still yours? You think you have a claim to my children? What sheep and goats do you see in my flocks that are not mine? What servant here bears your brand? Come on. Bring it out. Put it down here between us. Let others observe and judge. Jacob may have done much wrong to Esau. But he is innocent when it comes to Laban. Now think of that. What he has just rehearsed. Think back in your life for 20 years. <laughs> Some of you watching can't even remember 20 years. Not only has he not wronged Laban, but he has often been sinned against by Laban. Now he enumerates and illustrates the long list of grievances that he has against his father-in-law. For 20 years he has suffered at the conniving, deceiving Hands of this man. Through it all, he has kept his, the flocks with consummate skill. There have been no miscarriages. Imagine 20 years of managing a flock without a single loss to miscarriage. It's unheard of. He has endlessly and tirelessly and personally looked to the good of Laban's flocks and herd. He has fulfilled his agreement, serving the full 14 years for his wife. Ten times Laban has broken their contract by changing the wages. These are all verifiable. They are attested by everyone standing around. How dare, just how dare Laban accuse him of stealing a couple of worthless pieces of wood or stone. No, oh, but he was not alone in this long 20 year struggle. He acknowledges what God had promised when he fled from home, for God was with him. This was not just God's omnipresence, God's attending care was with him, so that he has all this wealth he has now, in spite of all that Laban could do. He also acknowledges the special care of God in the midst of affliction. God had provided and God had prospered. And now under threat from Laban, God had directly and personally intervened on Jacob's behalf. What Laban has heard as a warning, Jacob describes as a rebuke. Jacob has it right. There is a distinct Laban. You had better not accuse or judge, much less attack or destroy Jacob, for you, Laban, are at fault here. And it concludes then with a resolving covenant, verses 43 through 55. You see, there has to be a resolution of this conflict. It simply cannot 
apart. That's not peacemaking, that's peace faking. And so it has reached a crescendo, Laban's false accusation against Jacob and Jacob's righteous grievances against Laban have both been in each other's faces. You can see this, right? The veins in their necks are bulging. But there are dishonest assertions. Verses 43 through 45, Laban's next sentence is astounding in its hubris. Then Laban answered and said to Jacob, The daughters are my daughters, and the children, meaning the grandchildren, are my children, and the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see here is mine. But what can I do this day for these my daughters or for their children whom they have born? Come now. Let's make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and I. <laughs> These are my daughters. These are my grandchildren. These are my flocks. Everything here is mine. There's nothing I can do about it. You're going to take them. Implication, you thief. I have to give them up. So what can I do? Why don't we make a promise? Now, in the tradition, they both understood. Jacob took a stone and set it on a pillar to mark the occasion, the content of what was about to be promised. And they gathered the stones into a pile known as a memorial style. They sat down to eat a covenant meal. Then each in their respective languages, Laban in Aramaic and Jacob in Hebrew, called the place the heap of memorial. We see that then in verses 45 through 50. But Laban, incredibly, is not finished. He enters into this covenant with family threats. Verse 45, so Jacob took a stone, set it up as a pillar. Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. And they took stones and they made a heap. And they ate there by the heap. And Laban called it Jager Shahadutha. Jacob called it Jalid. And Laban said, the heap is a witness between you and me today. And therefore he named it Jalid and Mizpah, for he said, The Lord watch between you and me when we are out of each other's sight. If you oppress my daughters, if you take wives besides my daughters, although no one is with us, you see this. God is witness between you and me. Who is Laban to invoke God in this setting? I promise you that if you abuse my daughters or take more wives, then I call on your God to deal with you. Okay, at one level, these are his daughters and grandchildren. As, and Well, they used to be his flocks, but not anymore. There is nothing but a final thread, a final attempt to make himself look good as the defender of his family. He is still trying to intimidate Jacob. And he's attempting to use God as his stick. So build this covenant cairn, this heap of stones, and call God as witness. Call God as witness to and to make Jacob understand exactly what Laban is threatening. And in these verses, Laban and Jacob, verses 51 to 54, establish a border, a boundary. We would think of a demilitarized zone between them. Then Laban said to Jacob, See this heap and the pillar which I have set between you and me? This heap is a witness and the pillar is a witness that I will not pass over this heap to you and you will not pass over this heap, this pillar, to me to do harm. God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. Have you noticed this for free? How Laban never calls God his God. It's always the God of someone else. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. And Jacob offered a sacrifice in the hill country and called his kinsmen to eat bread. And they ate bread and spent the night in the hill country. 
So they mutually promised not to cross over this border with the intent to do harm. Probably both of them are thinking, do not cross this border again. You stay out of my lands and I will stay out of yours, you meddlesome, troublesome man. Laban and Jacob agree and enter into this covenant. I don't know it's worth the stone that was piled up as far as Laban is concerned. And Jacob invokes the awesome and fearful name of God with which he is personally familiar and he is personally moved by. He sacrifices to God and feasts with his family. God has been good. Jacob's integrity has been upheld. His father's law has been subdued. His God is pleased. And finally, with a peaceful departure, verse 55. And early in the morning, Laban rose and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned home. So Laban says goodbye. And he kisses his, fan, the, his daughters and children. And the Bible says that he blessed them. Now we don't know what that blessing was. Then he leaves and goes home. The conflict is over. But the story is not. So as we conclude, I want to focus on help for in-law trouble. Now, I'm aware that some of you are single, some of you don't have in-laws yet. And I know there are several families here where there are parents and sons and daughters as in-laws. Out of this narrative, we can address some challenges and some issues in our relationships with extended family. I don't have any personal experience of this. I've been married for 43 years. My father died before I was married. My mother was unable to come to our wedding across the country. Her mother was dying at the time. My mother and Esther's parents have never met. Never met. Now, now they probably know each other now in heaven, depending on what heaven is like right now. So this is all secondhand to me. Second, there are transferable principles here. This is a transition for Jacob and his family. It has been temptation to sin, to cling to idols, to make false accusation, to assert authority that is not biblical, and to make promises and agreements that may not be binding. Is any of this going on in your family? Has COVID time become a sinning time? Here's your core principle. Stop trying to solve family issues as a natural family. And deal with them as a spiritual family. Let me speak first for parents as in-laws. First, be concerned by be governed by the scriptures in your relationship with in-laws and sons and daughters. You must believe and bow to the scriptures as defining, determining, and directing how you engage one another as in-laws. Recognize their home as an independent sphere of authority. Parents, recognize your sons and your, your, your children's home, your married children's home, as an independent sphere of authority. And primary to this is acknowledging the headship of the man in his home. Oh, here's the hard one. Give up the desire for control, parents. For many parents, control is a difficult issue. You seek to extend the control you had over your kids into the new home. It is particularly difficult when they, oh dear, want to do things differently. Be poised to offer wise and biblical counsel. Learn how to take the scriptures, apply them from lessons in your own life, and give counsel in a way that invites being accepted but doesn't sound like exercise of authority. Do not use your station in life to manipulate and gain what you want. Do not use your status as grandparents, your money, your anything about this place as in-laws to shame your sons and daughters into what you want 
and crave. And do not compete with other in-laws for time, attention, and so on. Prefer one another. Be willing to give up your perceived rights when it comes to holidays, vacations, overnighters, and so on. Now, for sons and daughters as in-laws. Be governed by the scriptures in your relationship with in-laws and parents. You must believe and bow the scripture as defining and determining and directing how you engage one another as in-laws. Be one with your spouse in your relationship to your in-laws and parents. Implement the leave and cleave principle of the Bible. Where there are issues, the husband should leave and command with the wife counseling and following. Keep Christ and the church community as the center of your home. Help your parents and in-laws to have a Bible-centered view of life and ministry. But be prepared, be poised to accept their wise counsel. Humbly receive, weigh, and follow wise counsel. Be able to discern the difference between when you are being counseled and when you are being commanded. And finally, hear and heed this. As much as lies in you, live in peace with all men, including, for the glory of God, your in-laws. Bow to God's good providences in bad times, bad times, except with gratitude and with grace what he is bringing. Let's pray. We bow before you, Father, to seek your grace. We read this story with a certain sense of drawing back and horror and amazement. Uh, but we will admit it, sometimes we're in the midst of just our cultural expression of this very same stuff. Father, I pray that you would give grace to parents who have grown and married children to know how to wisely counsel, direct, love, be patient, prefer. And Father, I pray for sons and daughters that you would grant to them the grace, the wisdom, and at times the courage that is needed to do what's right. And Father, I pray that in this time in which so much of our sort of low voices in our heart suddenly are amplified that we, we wear that and we listen to that and we respond to that. May our lives be transformed for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen.